<laughs> Good evening. I'm Danielle Liebel, a program coordinator at the Institute for Women's Leadership, and thank you for coming tonight with Minnesota Vikings punter and equal rights activist, Chris Cluey. <laughs> we would also like to thank PRISM, the Intercultural Center, the Cultural Affairs Board, and Students for the Advancement of People with Disabilities for co-sponsoring this event. In fall of 2012, Chris Cluey started making headlines. Not for his football ability, as one might think, rather for speaking against an issue that is close to his heart. Earlier that fall, Baltimore Ravens linebacker Brendan Armangio faced <laughs> 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 <This> criticism <laughs> from a Maryland senator for releasing a video that said his support for same-sex marriage. Cluey responded, responded to this criticism, criticism supporting Armandio's stance. Cluey released a letter to the senator saying, you know that having these rights, what, having these rights will make gay Americans full-fledged citizens just like everyone else with the freedom to pursue happiness and all that it entails. This letter made him an unofficial spokesperson for the LGBTQ rights, a role he has taken on with ease. Cluey was featured in a documentary called The Last Barrier, which aired on NBC, where he spoke about his feelings toward equality. He also appeared on the Ellen DeGeneres show, where he was first the first inductee in her Hall of Fame for his support of marriage equality. Most recently, Cluey, along with Armando, filed a amicus brief to the U.S. Supreme Court where they expressed their support of the challenge to California Proposition 8. Chris Cluey has been an influential spokesperson and advocate for equality of all people, and we are grateful to have him here to speak tonight. So, without further ado, please help me welcome Chris Cluey. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, I'm not really much of a speaking person, <laughs> so uh, I've, I've found it's much easier to talk with people rather than talk at them. So I'm just going to give a very brief kind of overview of, of what I've done, what it means to me to, to speak out on this. And then we'll open up to questions and answers where you can ask me anything you want, because <laughs> uh, I find that's a lot more fun. So. Um, yeah, so, so a question I get a lot from, from a lot of people is, you know, why, why do you do this? Why does this mean so much to you? Why do you speak out on this? And for me, it's about justice. It's about equality. It's about treating other people the way you would like to be treated, which is how my parents raised me. And it's really an idea that societies that don't practice empathy inevitably fail because they promote division and conflict within their own borders. And if you look at it historically, every single civilization so far has failed, whether they have sought out conflict with, a, with another civilization outside their borders or whether they have promoted oppression within, they have fallen apart. And that's, that's something that, you know, I, I don't want to see happen to our society. <laughs> I think it would be a terrible idea. So, so uh, you know, when, when it comes to the issue of LBGTQ rights, it's, it's just another sign of what we need to be wary of, which is people trying to control how someone else lives their life. Because no one should be able to tell someone else how you live their life. As long as you respect other people's rights, as long as you let other people live, you know, free to live their own lives, then no one should tell you how to live your life. And right now, in America, there are gay citizens that pay their taxes, that serve in our military, that do everything required to be a citizen of the United States, 
and they are not allowed to benefit under the same laws as everyone else. And that's discrimination. That's something that tears a society apart unless it is dealt with. And you know, that's, that's why I speak out on this issue, because it, it's important to me. So um, yeah, enough speaking. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, don't be shy. Raise your hands. <laughs> Go ahead. How do you feel about uh, Jason Collins and kind of like, do you think more people will be coming out and like being consuming gear? Mm -hmm. How long do you think it will take to tell more people? Well, when, I, when I first saw Jason Collins' piece, um, you know, first off, I was really happy for him because he was able to finally be who he was. And, and one thing that really struck me from his piece was the quote that he had that, for 33 years, I felt like I've been baking in an oven. Because to me, that's, that's not how you should live your life. You should not have to hide a core part of who you are. And, and from just an athletic standpoint, think how much potential Jason Collins had to hide because he was busy hiding himself. As an athlete, you don't play at your full potential when you are worried about other things outside your life. You know, whether it's, it's a family member who's sick, if, you're, you know, if, if you have a kid, if your wife's pregnant, you know, if, if something is going wrong, then it affects you on the field. And if you have to hide who you are, then that's definitely going to affect who you are on the field. I mean, you, you cannot play to your full potential. And, and so I, I think that that's something that managers and coaches need to take into account is that if you have gay athletes on your team, and you most assuredly have gay athletes on your team, they are not playing to the best of their ability, which means your team is not playing to the best of its ability. And you know, just from a business standpoint, you need your team to play to the best of its ability because that's how you sell tickets. <laughs> it's a, you know, people like winning. So it's, you know, that, that, that was something that really, really stuck with me. And then as far as where things go from here, I think it's a great first step. But I think one thing that we absolutely have to watch is, is Jason Collins allowed to compete for a job? Is he allowed to have a fair shot at some other team? Because, you know, he's getting a little old in terms of NBA terms. He's played for 12 seasons. He's, he's 34, 35. But at the same time, he's a seven foot center that, you know, you, you can't really teach seven feet. I mean, that's, that's a very, very unique skill set. <laughs> so, there, there should be a spot for him if he shows he has the athletic abilities to do so. And for the past 12 years, he has shown he's had the athletic abilities to do so. So I, I think for a lot of other gay athletes, they're going to be watching what happens with Jason and, and saying to themselves, okay, if he gets a fair shake, you know, that makes it easier for me to come out because I know that won't affect me. Whereas if Jason doesn't get a fair shake, it's, it's going to set, you know, the whole thing back because they're going to be like, I don't want to lose my livelihood. I don't want to risk losing my job. And you know, that, that's, that's, that's not what, what can happen because that, that's, that's a terrible thing. I mean, it shows that there's still discrimination. So next question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um the bat phone hasn't rang. It's a <laughs> it's, <laughs> No, it's a I I haven't I haven't heard anything, but you know, I uh if a player does decide to come out, you know, I I will offer him my support, you know, just like I offer Jason my support, just like I would offer anyone my support because like I said, you should not have to hide who you are. You should not have to be forced to live a lie just because someone else thinks it might make them uncomfortable. And, and that's one of the things, I actually just did a uh, kind of like an email interview with, um, with some guy, I think it was for like CNN or something like that. But uh, it was one, one of the news, one of the news agencies. And um, essentially he was, you know, he, was, he was asking, you know, well, what about this idea that a, an openly gay player in the locker room will make other players feel uncomfortable? You know, that they'll be, they'll be scared to shower, you know, or, or that it'll, it'll make them, you know, feel like e there's a gay guy in here. And to me it's like, there have been gay players that have played in professional sports. No one has been mounted in the shower. <laughs> it's, it's like... <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, it's really this just narcissistic idea that if there's an openly gay guy in my locker room, well, of course he's going to be attracted to me. I'm the greatest looking thing on earth. I mean, I mean how, how self-involved do you have to be to make that your life view? And so it, it's, it's a work environment. The, 
Guys who have played who have come out as gay later have never caused a problem. And if something inappropriate does happen, there is an HR department. You report it to them. <laughs> it's just like if anything else happened in a work environment. So, yeah, I, I think that idea is just, it's nonsense. It's, you know, it's, it's absolute nonsense. So. Um, I've actually experienced almost overwhelmingly positive responses. I, honestly, I think it's because a lot of people are scared of the way I write. <laughs> it's because uh, <laughs> I, I don't hold back at all. <laughs> and um, but no, the thing is, is I had uh, I had about 45% of the guys in the locker room come up to me and say, "We may not agree with you on same-sex rights, but we appreciate you speaking up for Brendan because you know it, it was a First Amendment issue as well." And then 55% of the guys, the other 55%, came up and said, "We think you did the right thing. You know, thank thank you for writing that." And I've also had guys from other teams come up to me before games and say, "Hey, great job on that letter. You know, way to go." I'm like, "All right, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, don't don't block my punt, please." It's, uh, <laughs> it's so it's you know. It, it, there, there, there's definitely, you know, there, guys in the NFL definitely do get it. You know, there, there are guys who get it. Um, as far as like letters and stuff, uh, I have a, a, I've been keeping track of all the letters that I've gotten. So the stack of supporting letters is about this high, like that, and the stack of negative letters is about that high. And the, the negative ones, there's some really crazy people out there, so those are fun to read. <laughs> but really, the thing is, is that you know, if you get into a discussion with someone, if you know, if someone questions, you know, hey, why are you doing this? Hey, what's the deal? The, the best answer I found is, you know, what would you do in that situation? You know, if you were not free to live your life, what would your reaction be? You would want to be free to live your life. And that's, and that's what gay Americans want, is the freedom to live their own life. They're not asking for special privileges. They're not asking for anything out of the ordinary. They would like to be able to live how everyone else lives. And that's, I don't think that's unreasonable to ask for. I mean, that's what everyone should have. So, you know, really just frame it as an issue of freedom, of, of being able to live your life. So, next question. Back. Mm -hmm. Um, it, that really just depends on the players involved. You know, it, it depends on is that player comfortable enough in who they are to, you know, come out and potentially, you know, risk facing that backlash. And it, it takes a special kind of person to be able to do that, especially, you know, if, if, if you're one of the first people to do that. Because, Make no mistake, there will be backlash from fans, there will be backlash from other players, and you know, there, there will be backlash from, from coaches and administrators, because there will always be in society some people who don't get it. The thing is, is we have to keep making those strides forward because it is a generational issue, and a lot of the issues are solved to, again, be blunt, when the old people die off and the young people grow up. Because <laughs> the young people grow up knowing gay family members, gay teammates, and they're, they say, what's the big deal? I know this person. Them being gay has nothing to do with who they are. So I think that guys will hopefully come out, you know, in the, in the next couple years, will kind of follow Jason's lead. But it's also something that's going to take a lot of time in terms of society in general because, you know, look, we still have racism in this country and segregation was 50, you know, 55, 60 years ago. Um, it's, it's something that it really does take time. You know, it gets better as time goes on, but, you know, you just have to keep working at it. Well, hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I've I've had plenty of people say like, "Oh, you you use naughty words. You're a bad person." And and my my response to them is that Yes, I may have used scatological references or, you know, mashed up some, uh, some obscene words, but the people I am arguing against are cloaking the idea of oppression and slavery. And th that, to me, it doesn't matter what words you use to do that. That is something I'm going to fight against tooth and nail. Because when you say in your words that you want to control someone else's life, that you want to tell them how to live, then to me, that means you do not respect that other person as a human being. And I don't care how you word your letter. I mean, Emmett C. Burns was you know, pretty polite, but underneath his letter is this core of, I am going to control your life, and there is nothing you can do about it. And so 
I don't take that well. <laughs> and uh, I tend to use naughty words in return. It's, um, but, and, and, and to me, the, the other thing is, is it goes to, are people willing to look past the superficial and see the actual content of a message? Because what I write is, freedom is what we should all aspire to. We should all be able to live our own lives as long as we're not infringing upon the rights of someone else to live their life. And so, you know, when I see someone else writing against that, I'm like, well, I'm going to use whatever means at my disposal <laughs> to tell them that they're wrong. And you know, it's, 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 up to, it's up to the people who read it to say, okay, I can look underneath to see what this message is truly about. So, so yeah, I've, I've received some criticism, mainly from, my, my dad said, why you use bad words? I'm like, well, because I, I like to. <laughs> so, <laughs> go ahead. Um, I haven't had anyone come out to me personally. Uh, I, I gotta say, I don't really go looking for anyone. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's one of those things where, you know, when I'm in the locker room, I'm not trying to proselytize. I'm not trying to preach uh, because I'm there to play football. That's my job. And, and to me, I don't care what you do with your life. You know, that, that's, I'm free to live my life. Other people should be free to live their life. And it, it, it baffles me that people can't understand that. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go looking for anyone, but if someone were to come out to me, I, you know, I would, I would respect that and I would honor that. And it's, it's something that hopefully we get to the point where we don't have to worry about issues like this because they shouldn't be issues. I mean, it, it, it shouldn't be an issue to be who you are. You should be allowed to live your life. So no, I, 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 haven't, I haven't met anyone who's, who's come out, so. I have. <laughs> I have. It's, uh, yeah, it's coming out June 25th called Beautifully Unique Sparkle Ponies. And, uh, <laughs> yep, that's, that's an actual title. And uh, <laughs> the, the best part of the book cover is that it is me on a carousel horse staring off in the distance, and it was shot in my driveway as my new neighbors moved in. <laughs> so, so that was fun. But uh, the, the, the book itself deals with this idea of rational empathy, the, the idea that I said earlier that societies that do not practice empathy are inevitably doomed to collapse because they foster conflict and discord. And that's, that's one of kind of the underlying ideas. I also have um, thoughts on augmented reality, what we'll see going into the future. I have thoughts on video games. I have, you know, just random musings. It's essentially the book is a snapshot into my mind. So buyer beware. <laughs> it's, uh, but yeah, I mean, ho hopefully people will be entertained and, and hopefully they'll they'll learn something so in the back mm -hmm. okay Um, you mean, you mean like making sure they're not abused or anything? It's a okay. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's one of those things where there are millions of workplace environments across this country where straight and gay people work together with absolutely no issues whatsoever. The NFL should not be any different. It should be, you are here to do a job. These are your coworkers be a grown-up and act like you're at a job. I mean, I know that's difficult because we're, we're playing a child's game, but <laughs> we're, we're supposed to be adults. So, you know, it's, it's, it, treat everyone like an adult. Treat it like a workplace environment. And, you know, just like everyone else knows how to get along with their coworkers, no matter if they're straight or gay, you too can know how to get along with your coworker. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, sorry. I do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was asked to talk at uh, St. Olaf's, um, I think that was a month or two ago, and they were, I think they were the ones who, who you know, told St. Benny's about me. And, um, which, which St. Benny, St. Benedict? I, I have no idea. Everyone says Benny. <laughs> so, but, uh, no, I, I, I find that um, as, as far as the religious angle goes, 
a lot of religious people are okay with gay rights and same-sex marriage because they, they understand that the fundamental concept of the Bible is to treat other people the way you want to be treated. It's the golden rule. That is, you know, that is essentially what Jesus preached. And then the problem arises when you get it into the, the fundamentalists who are like, no, it says here in this one passage that you can't do this and then ignore the rest of the other passages that say completely crazy things <laughs> and, and don't understand that as we evolve as people, we understand that this is a guideline to how you live your life. It's not a hard set amount of rules, especially when it involves oppressing people. I mean, that, that is essentially the, the main question you should be asking yourself is, does my action oppress someone else? If it does, then you need to reconsider that action because that is the fundamental tenet of the Bible. It's about not being persecuted. So, yeah, I, 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 and, and sadly, I, a lot of people don't understand that, but <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm hopeful that if I keep saying it, they'll, they'll eventually come around. <laughs> Um, generally by being respectful, you know, my, my letter aside, uh, it was, it's, that, that, that was one where I just kind of went, uh, full guns blazing, but, uh, it's, no, it's, it's by being, being able to make other people aware of the fact that this is an issue of freedom, like I said earlier, and, and helping them understand that you need to have empathy in order to have a conversation about something. You need to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And, and for a lot of people, they simply don't know someone who is gay. They haven't had experience with a family member or a friend or, you know, a teammate who's, who's been gay. And I find that, especially you see that a lot with, with Republican politicians, is that all of a sudden when a family member comes out as gay, it's like, well, shoot, wait a minute, I need to backtrack on my positions because now this is affecting me personally. This is affecting my family. So if you, if you can get people just to understand that this is an issue that does affect people. It is a personal issue. And, you know, try putting yourself in someone else's shoes just for a day. Imagine how it would feel, you know, if you weren't allowed to get married to your spouse. If you, if you were in danger of getting fired from your job simply because of who you were. And, and you know, that, that's, that's the law in 29 states. You can be fired for being gay. No other reason. That's it. And that's, you know, that's something that most people, when they think about it, they're like, Wow, that's kind of messed up. <laughs> I don't think I'd like to be on the receiving end of that. So, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, just looking at those underlying issues and, and presenting them in an empathic and rational way. So. What would you recommend the NFL do, like, helping a more accepting environment for people who do want to come out, or mm -hmm. Well, I, I think just promoting stuff like athlete ally, uh, athlete ally, and you can play team, and, and just organizations, and making it known to the coaches and administrators especially that having a gay player will not affect your team. Yes, there will be some media attention, but there is media attention for everything in the NFL. And having media attention for a gay player is probably a lot better than having media attention because one of your players killed someone. <laughs> that's, uh, that, 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 that's, I, I think I'd take that, that, that trade right there. And, and, and the other thing is that, you know, as, as more and more gay players come out, it will start to become less and less of an issue. It'll, it will be, they are players just like everyone else. They just want to come here, do their job, and then go home to their family. And that's what, some, that's what everyone should be able to do. So really just kind of fostering that attitude of, it doesn't matter who you are. What matters is, can you do your job on Sunday? Um, well, I was asked on Twitter. That's uh, <laughs> so I, no. Seriously though, I, there was a um, a group called Minnesotans for Marriage Equality, and uh, you know they were working to to help defeat the amendment. And they they sent me a message on Twitter. They're like, you know, hey, would you would you like to become involved with with this movement? And I said, yeah, that seems like a great idea. <laughs> that's uh, you know that's that's something I can get behind. And so originally it was you know it was going to be a couple radio spots and then like a fundraising dinner. And then I wrote you know my letter and everything kind of got a little bigger. But <laughs> it was. Uh, for me, in my life, I've always felt that people should be treated equally, and you know, I have no problem saying that to, to the people around me, to my family, to my friends, you know, to, to the people who are involved in my life. With the rise of social media, that reach has expanded greatly, because <laughs> so the internet is an amazing thing. It, uh, you know, it allows you to reach a lot of people. 
And so now that you know I have kind of that platform, I feel it's 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 my duty and and also my honor to be able to keep speaking out on this and to tell people that you need to be free to live your life. You need to be free to be who you are because the the thing and, and here's another thing I don't think a lot of people understand from from the other side of the issue is that there are kids who kill themselves because they're gay because people you know, bully them because people taunt them. And that's, I mean, that should be abhorrent to any rational minded person is this idea that, yes, we can tease a kid until he kills himself. I mean, that, that is absolutely ridiculous. That, that's not what a functioning society should have happening within its borders. And so that's why I keep speaking out because, you know, stuff like that is, is not, it's not good for our future. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, really just try and find a support system to help you get through it as best as you can because there are people out there that will support you. You know, there's, there's organizations, there, you know, there will be family members, there will be friends. There, there, you know, find a group of people that you can trust to help you out because it's, it's when kids start trying to go it alone and feel like there's nothing else that they can do. You know, that's, that's when unfortunately suicides happen because they feel the whole world is against me and you know, I, I've got nowhere else to turn. So really just, you know, work to find that support group of people who will help you make it through. And then once you're old enough, go find a place where you can be yourself. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're gradually trying to make the whole world that place. But like I said, it's going to take some time. I mean, it, it really is a generational thing. And, you know, until we get to that point, you're just, you're going to have to find friends. You're going to have to find people who will prop you up when, you know, when you feel like, when you feel down. So... You know, really, really, and, and as, as allies, as straight allies, you know, I'm, I'm assuming there's probably quite a few straight allies in this room, you know, help make those support groups. Help those, help those kids feel welcomed and know that they have a place to go, you know, when things are bad at home, when they can't do anything, you know, w when they're being bullied or taunted. You know, help them know that there are people that have their back. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, I, I see it as, you know, this is a direction that the Vikings have chosen to go. I mean, you don't, you generally don't draft a punter in the fifth round unless he's going to be your starting guy. So, I mean, that's, that, that's the direction they want to go. That's the direction they want to go. I'm, I'm not in those meetings, so I can't influence that. The only thing I can do is to go out, punt to the best of my abilities, and trust in my body of work, which has been fairly reasonable over the years. <laughs> I'd like to think I've done a good job. And, um, you know, if, if that happens, if I end up getting, you know, released by the team, then I, I would like to find a, a job with another team because I think I still have, you know, another four or five years left in me at, at, at the least for punting. I'm, I'm only 31, which is right about when punters hit their prime. And it's, you know, I, I feel like I can still play in the NFL at a high level for, for at least four or five more years to come. So it's, uh, yeah, we'll see. The, the interesting thing is going to be to see, do I get a fair chance with other teams? So <laughs> it's, uh, that's, I think that'll say a lot about the NFL and, and what direction it's headed, you know, if, if that ends up being the case. Oh, I, I completely agree with musicians doing that. And, and in fact, our singer, a lot of the, the lyrics he writes has to do with social inequities and, you know, really people being treated poorly because there, there is so much in this world, you know, whether it be uh, social inequity, whether it be economic inequity, you know, there, there are so many problems besetting us right now that they are things we need to address. And 
a good song is a song that not only you know makes you tap your feet to the beat it's also a song that has a message behind it it's a song that tells you you know hey this is something that's wrong let's do something about it I mean one of my favorite bands is Rage Against the Machine because you know I, I love the fact that they're like this is something that's wrong go out and do something about it I mean because because if no one ever does anything about it then the problem never gets fixed so yeah we, we definitely make you know having a, a, a social message in our music, that, that's definitely something we look at. So, uh, in the back. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because, you know, when I, when I first came in, guys were like, who is this guy? Like, you know, he's, he's reading books in the locker room. He's, you know, he's, he's really good at video games. He keeps beating us. And, but, you know, that's, that's the way I've always lived my life is that, yes, while I am a football player, that is not the entirety of who I am. That is a small portion of who I am. I am so many other things, just like everyone in this room is so many other things. You, you know, you can't, you can't try and label someone as just one thing. Just like you can't label someone as, oh, he's gay. That's all he is. Or she's an athlete. That's all she is. Or, you know, she's, she's a teacher. That's all she is. That's, that's not something you can do because human beings are complex creatures. So for me, I just tend to, I guess, show it a little bit more because <laughs> I, I really enjoy my hobbies. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's something I've, I've never been afraid to hide is that, yes, I am a professional athlete, but I'm also a nerd. I really like books. I love playing video games. And, you know, I'm also a father. I have two wonderful daughters and, and a wife. And, you know, I'm, I'm all these things because I'm a person. That's, that's what people are. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, let me, let me, uh, yeah, I'll call him right now. No, it's, uh, no, a AP's a great guy. He's, uh, he's, he's one of the nicest people I've been around. And, you know, he, he really works very, very hard at what he does. And it's, uh, you know, you can tell. I mean, he's, he's one of those guys that when he gets out on the field, he is giving you everything that he has. And, you know, it's great to play with a teammate like that because you know that they are going to do their best for you because they want to help the team win. And, th and that's something I think every athlete should, should strive to do is that, you know, you're there to do well for yourself, but you're also there to do well to help your teammates, you know, to, to foster that bond between each other so that everyone is working towards that common goal. Um, I've gotten asked by a couple groups now to, to get involved in stuff and, um, for me personally, the, the main issue with our politics right now is the fact that there is entirely too much money involved in our political system. And the problem is in order to fix that problem, you need to enact sweeping changes, which our government is expressly designed against. Our government is designed to move very slowly, and that's for a reason. It's because our founders saw, you know, the sweeping changes that were happening during their times, and they said, we don't want that to happen in this country. We want this country to be stable. and the issue with that is, is that our founders relied on a moderately educated populace in order to make sure that those kind of creeping changes that would corrupt the system never got into the system or were corrected before they went too far. Unfortunately, <laughs> for the past 20, 25, 30 years, we have been allowing those creeping changes to happen and now we are in the position we're at where you have to have a certain amount of money before you can even play the game. And that raises the issue of who are you beholden to? Are you beholden to the people of the country? Uh, you know, are you going to do the right thing for them? Or are you beholden to your political donors who will ensure that you keep your office? And the, the really sad thing is that so many people that run for politics now view it as a job. And it's not a job. You are a public servant. You are there to help your country. You are there to serve the people of the country. You're not there to try and make a quick buck, you know, by any means possible, because that's what brings civilizations down, is the corruption of government. So I, I, I really hope that, you know, we, we are able to make some sort of change at some point. You know, hopefully Citizens United gets overturned at some point, because <laughs> that's not really a great thing. <laughs> it's a... Uh, Despite what the Supreme Court may say, uh, corporations are not people. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, um, you know, it's, 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 it's really one of those things that unless, as a society, we start making those small changes to bring our government back in line, you know, it's just going to keep continuing down the path we're going right now, and more and more power will be concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And if you look at it 
in a historical context, that only ends one way, and that's revolution. And the question is, is it pitchforks or is it guillotines? So, <laughs> the, uh, you know, as, as, as citizens, that's something you need to consider, is that do we want to let our country keep going down this path? And, you know, if not, are we going to be able to work together, you know, for a long enough time frame to be able to change it? Um, I, I don't think there's any inherent bias in any, any sport over any other. It's because uh, the thing is, is that all sports are a cross sampling of society. You know, you get guys who are raised in a variety of different environments and football, I think is probably the broadest cross sampling just because of how many players there are. There's, there's about 1800 players in football versus like three or 400 for basketball. And I think like, was it like eight or 900 for baseball? Something like that. Um, ho and hockey is, uh, actually hockey may be up there too, I think that's like 13 or 1400. But the thing is with, with the, the amount of people you have playing the sport, you know, you're always going to have people who don't get it, you're always going to have people who do get it, and then you're going to have, you know, kind of that clump in the middle who can be swayed either way depending on how you present the argument. And so the key is, is to present that argument in the way that players understand that what their teammates you know, how their teammate's sexuality is, is not dependent, like that doesn't determine how they play. It's, it's, it's something that players have to realize that you can be who you are and still play very well out on the field. And then, you know, once, once they realize that, you'll start seeing that shift more and more towards more guys accepting it. Uh, right there. Uh, do you think that more athletes or Um, I would like to see it. I'm, I'm not going to make anyone do anything because, again, you know, I, <laughs> I don't want anyone to make me do anything. So <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where I think as an athlete, you have a platform and, you know, it's, it's up to you how you use it. And, you know, uh, the underlying issue of that is, you know, should athletes be considered celebrities, which, you know, is, is its whole other argument <laughs> is, uh, you know, we don't, we don't consider our, our doctors and scientists and teachers celebrities, but, you know, you can run around and play a kid's game, you're a celebrity. <laughs> so... That's, that's, more a, that's more a societal issue than anything else. But um, no, I think as an athlete, you know, you do have this platform. And the problem is so many guys use that platform to, you know, get in trouble. It's you're out driving drunk or, you know, you abuse your, your spouse or, you know, you, you run some sort of illegal drug operation or something. And, and that tars everyone else with that brush that, oh, all athletes are knuckle-dragging troglodytes, which, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of very smart athletes out there, but, you know, the vast majority of them just go to work, take care of their business, and then go home to their families. And, you know, it's, it's something that I think if, if coaches and management make players aware that they won't be considered a, a distraction if they're speaking out on important issues, then I think you'd start to see more and more guys speaking out on important issues. Uh, in the back. <laughs> um, I think it's one of those things where it can be very denigrating to, to people around those who use them because you don't know who is around you who might be gay, who you, know, you don't know is gay, and you don't know how that person's going to take it. It's, it's the same thing that I don't think we've reached that point in our society yet where you know, people can use casual slurs without, you know, without it adversely affecting someone else. I mean, it, it, it's still very much a problem it, because gay people have been discriminated against for so long in this country that it's, you know, it can create a very hostile workplace environment if you do something like that. So I think that, that words like that are greatly to be avoided, especially because there's so many other really good curse words you can use. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> it's like, you don't, you, you don't have to denigrate an entire group of people to, you know, to really let someone know how you feel. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of other, other options out there, and, you know, I've, I've used many of them. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's lazy swearing, and I'm, I'm not a fan of lazy swearing. You know, you should at least put some effort into it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's one of those things that we need to work to, to try and make people aware of. Yes, you're using this word, but you don't realize the effect it has on someone, you know, who, who is affected by this word. You don't realize what it does to them when you use it around them. Yep. Oh, thank you. 
Um, well, I saw the, uh, uh, the Presidential Proclamation of Loyalty Day for May 1st, and um, you know, I, I realize that that's something that's been going on since like 1920, but the thing is, is the fact that as a society, we have not gotten rid of a proclamation like that really is not a good sign because that was designed specifically as a piece of propaganda to try and combat communism. And if you are a nation, you should not have to tell your citizens to be loyal to you. Your actions should make your citizens want to be loyal to you. You have to earn your citizens' trust. It's not something that you can command from them. And you know, it's, it's just really something that I have a, a deep-seated problem with. I, I think I retweeted a person that, that said it perfectly, is that I love America. I love America with all my heart. I do not like America telling me to love it. <laughs> it's, you know, that's, that, that's not something that this country is founded on. So you know, it's, it's just stuff like that they really drive me crazy because, again, historically, we can look back and see what happens to societies that start promoting these ideals and let them creep into modern day use and no one thinks about it, is that you start walking down that road towards conflict. And, you know, that, that doesn't end well. So, yep. Um, just fundamental equality. I mean, it, it, everything I do boils down to the basic concept of treat other people the way you want to be treated. You can plug that into every single situation in life except for S and M, and it, and it will. Uh, <laughs> and 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 it will work perfectly. It's it's any. It, so, oh, this is a Catholic school, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you know, it, it, it's a very easy equation and it works every single time because if you're on one side of the equation and you're contemplating an action and then you put yourself on the other side of the equation you say would I be okay with this happening to me if the answer is no then don't do that action it's not it's not a very hard concept to figure out it's it's basic empathy and you know it's it's something that I really hope more people learn to use because again if we don't then you know we're we're fighting each other we're dissolving as a society uh, I'm gonna plead the fifth on that one <laughs> it's uh, I, I will say my ownership has been very supportive of what I've done it's uh, next question <laughs> No, I don't. I don't like politics. <laughs> it's uh, again because the the main main issue I have with politics, you know, is is the whole money thing and and the fact that, you know, I don't think as a society we're doing enough to promote education and tolerance in this country. And the problem is when you don't promote education in a country, then you get uneducated people voting who are then going to vote for things that they don't know about and that leads to stuff like government officials speaking out against basic science which is not a good sign <laughs> that's uh, that's really not a good sign and so in order to make sweeping drastic changes you're talking about running with a conspiracy of about three to four hundred people hopefully half of them get elected and then hopefully that half that gets elected then passes legislation to limit their own power so good luck getting three to four hundred people to keep a secret and then good luck getting a cab a cabal of two hundred people to vote to limit their own power once they realize they have that power i mean it's uh... you know it's, it's really it's something that we, it, it, it can't just be one person, it has to be a bunch of people, and you know, I'm, I'm, I, I have a lot of people asking me to run for politics, they're like, you know, you could make a difference, but you know, you, you look at all the just crazy policies that are being promulgated these days, you know, especially from, I, I don't want to, to stereotype or, or, you know, use any sort of bad images, but you know, from, from the southern states, from the deeply red states, and it's just, institutionalized ignorance and the fact is is those people are going to keep being elected every single year because the citizens in their state do not know any better they, there's a reason that these states are cutting education they do not want their citizens to be able to vote intelligently because that will kick those people out of office I mean, it's uh, you know it, it's, it's it's just our, our political system is so messed up right now and I, I honestly don't see a fix for it so Sorry to, sorry to burst all your bubbles. Good luck in life. <laughs> mm. 
Um, it came from how my parents raised me. You know, they, they always said treat, you know, treat other people the way you want to be treated. And it also comes just from observing the world and, and trying to apply a logical and rational mindset to what I see around me. So many of the problems I see around me could be so easily fixed if people realized that if they were in the other position, they would not want this to happen. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a simple solution, yet people just are unwilling to do it. And, and the thing that really bugs me is that we all learn that lesson in kindergarten. <laughs> you, know, you learn, play nice with others, treat them the way you'd like to be treated. And then as you grow up, it's kind of like, oh, I need to make a lot of money or, you know, I need to, I need to have the flashy sports car or, or you know, the, the nine rated wife or whatever. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, just, it's just this idea that, that as, as a culture, we promote the shallow and the superficial over the long-term consequences of our actions. And you know, we're, we're starting to see that catch up to us, and it's going to keep catching up to us until we change that point of view. So, uh, Um, I don't, it's, it's, it's tough because all you can do is hopefully provide an example for them and, you know, hope that they do the right thing. And it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, for, for every 10, 15, 20 people like me, you have someone, you know, like Justin Bieber, who's, you know, he's, he's got this huge social media platform. He could affect so many lives, especially impressionable minds. And he just decides to go do stupid stuff. And that, and that you know, that, that actively harms our society because those people looking at Justin Bieber as a role model are like, when I grow up, I want to be just like the Biebs. And it's like, well, great. You want to go get in fights with people and really not have a thought in your head and, you know, just generally act like a douche? Um, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it, it's just one of those things where, you know, we, we, we have to expect more from our role models. We, as a society, we have to demand of our role models that they be role models and that they be positive role models because otherwise why are you following them as a role model so other questions uh something that's been coming up recently for the NFL has been dealing with the lag results that are the mm-hmm. yeah CTE um, I think it's an issue that uh, is definitely affecting uh, a lot of the older players because they didn't know that it was an issue. I think the younger players that are coming into the league know that it's a possible issue, but they also know that they will get paid more than enough money for what they do that you know they're willing to take that risk. And it's, it's something that the older players need to be taken care of because they did not know the risks they were undertaking the younger players need to learn financial responsibility so that if they do become affected by that risk, they have the resources available to take care of themselves. And the NFL does, you know, the best it can to try and teach guys to take care of their money. But unfortunately, that is, again, more of a societal problem. We have so many people in our society that don't know how to balance a checkbook, that don't understand why making the minimum payments on your credit card is not a good idea. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's this idea that, that, you, you can just use money wherever. You can go get a credit card. You can go you know, buy your instant gratification stuff and not have to worry about the, the consequences down the line. And you know, that, that filters up when you grow up. I mean, you, you have kids growing up that don't, that don't understand the value of money and how to make that work for you long term. And you know, that's, that's, that's another thing that we need to look at because it, if you don't look at it, then you're going to essentially doom yourself to economic slavery because you're always trying to dig your way out of that hole. Um, what kind of the NCAA have to make in order to shift the from just professional sports making money to evaluating education and evaluating educating athletes getting their degrees before moving on to professional sports? Um, that's a tough one because I think the, I think the NCAA first has to make institutional changes in themselves because right now the NCAA is a billion dollar industry and the athletes don't see any of that money. I mean, it's, yeah, you get your scholarship, but at the same time you're putting in, you know, six, seven hours a day just for your sport. And that is something that is very hard to do that and take classes at the same time and have anything remotely resembling a normal social life, especially in college. <laughs> it's, uh, you, know, you, want, you want to hang out with your friends. And with those three things pulling at you, 
normally one of them is going to suffer. And so I, I think the NCAA needs to realize that, yes, while this may be good business for you and the colleges, it's not good business for the kids who are the you know, direct involve, involvement in that. And it, I, I honestly don't know what the solution to that is. I mean, it's, it's, as, it's something as a society, we need to value the education of our students more rather than the entertainment they provide on, on Saturdays. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that we all have to work together for. And, you know, it's more education as you grow up helps you shift that balance from valuing entertainment over education. Well, it, it frustrates me when I see guys acting stupid with their money. I mean, <laughs> that's just, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Like, the, the thing that really bugs me is that, uh, I think it was like three years ago, the NFL finally made contributing to your 401k mandatory because up until then, about half the league wasn't contributing to their 401k and, le and the teams matched that two to one up to $16,000 from your contribution. So you were getting $32,000 a year free <laughs> and guys weren't doing it because they're like, I want the money now. And, and I mean, and again, that goes back to the whole educating people as they grow up to be financially responsible, to know how to use their money. And, you know, I, I see these, you know, these guys all around me, the rookies trying to live up to the veteran lifestyle. And, and that's, you know, you try and tell them, don't do that because you haven't made your money yet. The reason these veterans can afford to live in that lifestyle is because they've played for seven or eight years. They have that money. Yeah, you want to be like that, but first you need to play for those seven or eight years. Otherwise, if you're out of the league in two, you're going to have nothing to show for what you've done. And that's, you know, that's not a good thing. So it's, it's really educating people on the value of thinking long term instead of short term. So, uh, Um, I mean, pretty much wherever. We, we just play wherever we can. It's a, I'm, I'm not going to lie, being the punter for the Vikings opens a lot of doors that, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> you know, pro probably aren't available to the normal musician trying to, you know, trying to play a gig. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, send me a message on Twitter. <laughs> It's, uh, but no, it, it's, it's, you know, it, the thing is, if your music's good, then, then people will, will flock to it. I mean, for a case in point, look at Macklemore with, with Same Love. I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly, you know, what you're talking about. You can make good music and still talk about meaningful social issues. So it's, it's really just putting in that time, you know, working at it, working at it, working at it. And, you know, in his story is, is, you know, he had to work at it for a very long time before he finally made it. And, you know, there's, there's no substitute for time. And unfortunately, you know, it's, it's, it's something that sometimes you may never make it. I mean, no matter how much time you put in, no matter how much desire you have, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. And, you know, you just, you got to keep trying. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's how much does it mean to you? And are you willing to, you know, to keep sacrificing to get that message out? So... Um, it, it, it depends on when you come in and what your contract is. Most guys are actually making minimum wage, which is still pretty, pretty good. It's a uh, minimum wage for rookies this year, I think is like 390,000. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's not, not a bad job to have coming out of college. Um, I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd say on average, you know, most, most guys are making probably like six to seven hundred thousand if they're kind of you know backup players special teams players uh if you're if you're a skilled position player you're probably making one to two a year and then if you're like a marquee player you know you're kind of anywhere from like three to eight if you're a quarterback you're making an absolute buttload of money right now because <laughs> the nfl is turning but turning into a quarterback driven league and so it's um yeah it's one thing there there is economic disparity in the locker room but you know it's it's one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was my rookie year from uh, the kicker of the Seahawks at the time, Josh Brown. He said, don't ever look at someone else's paycheck. 
Because the thing is, you have to be happy with what you're getting. And you know, no matter what the other guy's getting, you're not going to be able to affect that. So be happy with your life. You know, make what you have work for you. And then you'll be much more fulfilled. Because if you're always trying to compare yourself to someone else, then you're never going to find happiness. I mean, that, that's, that's the whole thing. You know, trying to keep up with the Joneses. That's idiocy. You're, you know, who cares what the Joneses do? Care what you do. So... I think if someone can play, it doesn't matter what their gender is. It's it, it really is. Can you compete on the same playing field? And you know, can you do your job? I mean, and, and that goes for any job. It doesn't matter who you are, what your race is, what your gender is, what your sexuality is, what your religion is. If you can do the job, you can do the job. And I mean, that's I, I you know I wish more people viewed it that way because there's there's nothing inherently wrong with with being who you are. I mean, it's you're. Your actions define you, not what you look like, not what you believe. It's what you do that defines you. And if you can do your job, then you can do your job. Other questions? Bueller? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you you should. <laughs> Wait, what was, what was that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so I'll address the second one first. I yeah, might sign the cheese head, but as a punter, you should love me as a Packers fan because I'm giving your team the ball when I'm on the field. <laughs> I should be your favorite player. <laughs> so, uh, and as as the first one, the um. The thing is, NFL teams have almost this pathological need to know everything they can about their players because they don't want an issue to arise that could potentially be a distraction. And so NFL teams need to realize that, yes, while you may want to know that information, you should not be asking for that information because it puts players in a very uncomfortable spot. And it's something that, you know, is forbidden by federal law in, in quite a few places. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not exactly legal to ask for someone's sexuality when you're determining whether you're going to hire them or not because that's discrimination. So it's, it's one of those things where I think the NFL, that, that's a place where Roger Goodell could you know, really make an influence. And I, you know, I think he's, he's trying to do that with the, the most recent memo he put out is that teams, you need to abide by the laws just like everyone else. Yes, you may be making a lot of money, but you need to abide by the law. And the law is, is that you should not be asking these questions because it is discriminatory and it can adversely affect the person you're asking the questions to. So, all right. another one. Okay. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. It's, yeah. It'll probably be only of uh, of, of effect to, to me and you, but <laughs> um, no, it was great. My my high school uh, growing up was Los Alamitos, and um, it, yep, right there representing in the jersey. <laughs> and uh, no, it was great because it was a um, you know it was a Southern California high school, and it's uh, it's an interesting school in that it, it's kind of a normal high school, and then also has the Orange County High School of the Arts attached to it. So you have this wide diversity of students on you know on the high school grounds, and. I think it's a really good place to learn about different cultures, about different people, because, you know, first off, you're in California, which is already a, a pretty big melting pot, and then when you add in, you know, kind of the normal high school atmosphere with a performing arts school atmosphere, you know, you get that broad array of views. And, you know, I'm not going to claim growing up that I was a saint. You know, I, I made fun of the performing arts students because I, you know, I was a dick back then. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's uh, you know, me, that's, me and my friends did that. But, you know, growing up, I realized that, you know what, hey, I shouldn't be doing that because you shouldn't be making fun of someone else of what they do. You know, just, just as I wouldn't want someone making fun of me for, you know, for reading books or, or playing video games, you know, I shouldn't make fun of someone else for, for being interested in dance or, or band or something like that. And, you know, I, I really think that a high school like that is, is a good environment because it does expose you to all those different views. And, you know, from, from what I've seen, the, you know, the college here is very good in doing that because the more views you can expose yourself to, the more ready you are to experience life because the world isn't just this little corner. It's the entire world. And, you know, you have to be aware that there are billions of other people out there who may think differently, who may look differently, who may act differently, who may believe in different things. And we all have to get along together. Otherwise, we're probably going to end up killing each other. <laughs> so that's, that's something to be avoided. <laughs>
All right, other questions? Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. We we just finished up recording um, our finally finished up our vocals for our fourth one, and uh, I think it sounds amazing. But <laughs> I might be a little biased. <laughs> it's uh, it we're we're working on editing right now, and then probably mixing within the next month or so. So we're hoping to have it within I want to say like two or three months. But yeah, there's there's definitely another CD coming out, and you know it's a, again there's you know there's there's social issues in there. There's there's this idea that you know one of the songs is about am I going to stand up and do the right thing, or am I just going to roll with it? Am I am I just going to be whatever? You know, I'll just go on with my life. You know, I've I've got you know a nice car and and just enough shoes. Is you know is that enough to comfort me in life? And you know that's that's a question people need to ask themselves. Is that when you see something happening, are you willing to stand up and say something? Because if we, if enough of us say something, then we can change things. But if everyone just rolls with it, then well, we're going to be right in the same place we're at. <laughs> uh, <laughs> actually, I haven't heard it. <laughs> it's uh, I, from from reviews I've heard. It's kind of weird, though. It's uh, <laughs> Brad Paisley and LL Cool J. Not not exactly the the best mix, I don't think. So yeah, I, I can't really comment on that because I, I I I haven't heard the song. So I don't think anyone should be racist, though. It's kind of ignorant. <laughs> Way in the back. Favorite song? Um, he, that's a tie. It's between Enema by Tool and uh, Killing in the Name by Rage Against the Machine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Again, both with some very concrete social messages within the lyrics. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I like both of them. <laughs> Um, have conversations with people. Talk to people. You know, as, as, as much as you can, if you see something happening that you don't agree with, speak out on it. You know, write, write your own letter. Write, you know, write to someone else. Involve someone with a conversation. Because the thing is, is that if everyone waits for someone else to do something, then nothing ever changes. You know, some, someone has to take that step. Someone has to be willing to say, no, that isn't right. I'm not going to stand for it anymore. And, you know, it's, it, it can be hard to do. Because a lot of times, it, it might be someone you respect. It might be a family member. You know, it might be, it might be your boss. It, you know, there, there are sacrifices involved in standing up for doing the right thing. So it, it's just something that you have to make that personal choice that is the world I'm going to live in, is it going to be a world that's more free? Is it more equal? Or is it a world where people aren't allowed to live their own lives? Um, I think women's professional athletics are great because everyone should be able to play. Um, I think the reason they're not as popular is that we live in a very mis misogynistic society, and you know there there is a very, very much a patriarchal attitude still prevalent in the United States, and that's something that you know we need to continue to combat. Uh, sorry, need to continue to combat because what it does is there's 50% of our population is women, yet <laughs> we're not allowing that 50% to reach their full potential, and as a culture, as a civilization, if everyone isn't contributing to their full potential, your civilization isn't contributing to its full potential. You're not realizing everything you could be doing. And so I think it's just, it's absurd to think that just because someone's a woman or just because someone's gay or just because someone's black or Chinese or white or whatever, that they can't do the same things as everyone else. I mean, that's, that's asinine. We, we are all able to do, you know, as much as we want up to the limits of our ability. The, the only thing that should hold you back is what you, you yourself are capable of doing. No one else should be able to hold you back. It's, it's your choice how far you want to go. So, yeah, I, th I think we have a lot of strides to be made, you know, in the issue of, of women's equality in the United States because, again, and that's another generational thing. You know, we, we had suffrage uh, over 100 years ago, yet we're still dealing with the, with the idea that women aren't as capable as men, that women can't do the same thing as men. And, you know, this, this is something that, you know, I don't know if a lot of you know it, but there's still a huge rape culture in the United States. You know, there's the, the Steubenville case where the, the football players raped a, a young girl and then posted her pictures on Facebook. And it wasn't until a whole bunch of people got really outraged about it on, on social media that, that the police started investigating. I mean, that's, that is a huge problem. That you're talking about ruining a young woman's life just for your own entertainment and then posting the pictures on Facebook. That should be something that everyone looks at that and says, no, that is not what we allow to have happen in our society. 
So I mean, it, it's it's we need to treat other people the way we want to be treated. That's that's what it basically boils down to is having empathy. So. Um, I don't agree with what he said, but it is his right to say it. I mean, that's, that's his opinion to have. The thing with having freedom of speech is that you are free to say what you want, but you're also free to face the consequences of saying that. And, you know, I think what, what Jason Broussard is finding out is the fact that society is moving in a direction where religious fundamentalism is not something we want to see happen because we see what happens in countries all over the world when religious fundament fundamentalism is allowed to run the country. I mean, you look at Iran, you look at Pakistan, you look at, you know, the Taliban, uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, these, these are all countries where religious fundamentalists are allowed to rule and there is much less freedom than there is that we have here. And so I think the goal of every person should be you can believe whatever you want you know, I have, I have no problem with what anyone's beliefs, you know, happen to be. But if your actions oppress someone else, then I am not cool with that. Like that's, you know, because that, the thing is, is that you wouldn't want that to happen to you. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want someone telling you, no, you can't believe in, in what you want to believe. Because, again, that's someone else trying to control your life. So while I feel that, you know, Chris Broussard may possibly regret saying those things now. You know, he, he absolutely does have the right to say them, but as a society, we need to look at statements like that and realize that when you say something like that, you know, you are essentially promoting the idea that you would, you want to control someone else's life because you're, you're trying to shame them into being something else when they should be free to live, you know, how they want. So, uh, left side. Could string two words together. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think me, you know, speaking out on on that kind of hopefully shows that you can be involved in something else other than just your sport. And you know, it it's it's really when I do something, I'm going to do it to the very best of my ability. So if I'm fighting for the rights of other people, I am not going to hold back. <laughs> that's uh, you know, because because I, I I feel strongly about it. That's that's something that I believe should be done. And you know, I I hope other other athletes, other prof professional you know sports people and inter entertainers look at it and say, you know what, if if he can write a letter and you know affect change, maybe I can write a letter. Maybe I can give a speech. Maybe I can do something to to reach people and and help them realize that. Empathy is something that we want to be moving towards. You know, we don't we don't want to be moving towards oppression and intolerance because that's you know not a good idea. So. Mm-hmm. Well, hope, I would hope that other teams would view me solely based on my ability to punt a football, because that's, that's my job. I mean, that's what I do on the football field is the only thing teams should be looking at, because what I do away from the football field is my personal life. That's, you know, just as I don't try and tell other people what to do with their personal life away from the football field, so too do I ask the freedom to, you know, be allowed to live my own personal life away from the football field. So it should be, it should be interesting to see what happens, because, you know, there's, there's, I think, four or five teams that, you know, are looking for punters right now, so I would hope that I would be able to get a free, sh you know, I would hope that I would be able to get an equal opportunity to, you know, at least try out for those teams and, you know, have a chance at making them. So, and like I said, if not, you know, that's that's not not a good sign for the NFL. <laughs> so, uh, the way back? Or are you just scratching? Okay. <laughs> 
Um, right now, actually I just picked one up. It's a science fiction book called The Lives of Tao. It's kind of just a general science fiction action-y book. Um, I pretty much read every sci-fi fantasy book that I can. It's uh, you know, I, it's got to have a decent story. You know, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of Twilight because it's uh, it's not very well written. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's you know, it's it. it to, to me, for books, I look at, is it entertaining, and does it have something underneath that I can get at? Because the thing you notice with a lot of science fiction and fantasy books is that the writers draw upon historical actions in order to tell their story. They'll, they'll take you know, something that has happened in human history, slap a new coat of paint on it, and then maybe draw some, some conclusions from it. So if you can look underneath the writing to find the actual meat of what they're writing about, you know, it, it makes these stories so much more interesting. And, and that's not to say you can't just read, you know, science fiction fantasy for fun because you know it's always fun to read about lasers and dragons and stuff but you know the other thing the the the, the other thing is that you know you, you can read them for more like you know, if you, if you're reading game of thrones then you're essentially reading about the war of the roses i mean that's that, that you're reading history so it's uh <laughs> you know there there is more there if you want to go looking for it Yeah, no, all, all the time we have great discussions in the locker room. You know, there's, like I said, there's a lot of very smart guys in the locker room. It's just you generally don't hear about them because they, they take care of their business and then they go home. And for me, it's, it's, you know, if guys want to have a discussion, I'm more than happy to talk about anything. And, you know, if they don't, then I'm like, okay, that's fine. This, you know, we're, we're here to play football. So if, if you don't want to talk about anything, then I'm okay with that because that's, you know, this isn't the, the forum for that. And it's, uh, you know, I, I try to respect my teammates just as, you know, they, they respect me. I think, I think it's a good sign because video games are almost interactive art if they're done well. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a sign that game developers are finally figuring out that video game, pl video game players aren't just sweaty nerds in their parents' basements. <laughs> it's, you know, there's, there, there are, l yep, sorry, sorry to all the sweaty nerds in your parents' basements. <laughs> but, um. No, they're, 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 they're figuring out that there are so many people that play video games now that you can use this medium to tell a story and you can use it to comment on social issues of the day. And it doesn't just have to be mindless entertainment. You can have a message within your game. And, and you know, there, there's that debate, uh, you know, are video games art? If you can have a meaningful social message within your medium, then you are art. That's, you know, that, that's one of the definitions of art is, you know, you, you are sending a message to someone. So... Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's a valid concern, and it's it's something you know that that I, I think about because I do enjoy playing violent video games. You know, I, I like first-person shooters. I, I like strategy games. I like tactics games. Basically, I like everything except for sports games. I'm really bad at sports games, <laughs> but. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's this idea that in a video game you can, you know, you can run around, shoot someone, get shot in return, and then there's, there's no consequences. I mean, I, I think it would be better if, you know, for violent video games, if there were actual consequences to your actions, like say every time you die in a first person shooter, you can't respawn for five minutes. I mean, that's, that's an actual consequence. That lets you know that if you take up a gun and do something, there is something that will happen. It's not just, you know, pixels falling down on a screen. There, there is something to be lost here. And uh, it's, it's, and it's also something that parents need to teach their children. They need to teach their children that this is a video game, yes, but it can also influence you as a person. And you need to understand the difference between reality and what is not reality. And, you know, don't let the two mix together. So. What's your favorite on-the-field memory? Is a uh, Favorite on-the-field memory? Um, in the... And I, 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 this will probably bring back bad memories for other people, but in the, uh, in the, in the NFC Championship game against the Saints, it, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. The, the first punt that I hit, our gunner ran down and knocked the absolute shit out of Reggie Bush. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. 
<laughs> and and he fumbled the ball, and we recovered it on the six-yard line. Now we now now we fumbled the ball like three plays later. But you know, it's, you, you can't have everything. <laughs> so, but no, that 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 felt amazingly good because you know the last time we had played, he'd returned two for touchdowns on me. So it was like, yes. <laughs> Uh, it is very hard. I have not yet succeeded. <laughs> it's a, a lot of people have not succeeded either. It's um, he, he's you know he's just so quick and he has this ability to be. He looks like he's running full speed and then he kicks it into another gear and now he's running full speed and then he just changes direction on a dime and it's like I mean I, I've seen him out juke like five guys in a row and it's like what do you do? I mean <laughs> how, do you, how, how do you even stop that? It's because I mean, these guys aren't trying to miss they're trying to tackle him he's just like whoop 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 and then you know all of a sudden he's running down the field with three lead blockers I'm like well I'm not gonna get to him so <laughs> it's uh yeah he's, he's a pretty phenomenal athlete. Anyway. Um, a little something like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's never a good sign when I'm, you know, when I'm in position to try and make a tackle. It's mainly it's, I, I want to try and slow them up enough to where someone else can get a pursuit angle and run them down before they score. But a lot of the time it's, you know, it's me and then there's like 10 yards this way, 10 yards that way. This guy runs a 4-3, I run a 5-1. I'm probably not going to catch him. So it's, it's, you know, hopefully I can redirect him enough to, to where someone else can tackle him. I believe I have nine, I think, tied with Jerry Rice. Oh yeah. <laughs> Greatest of all time. <laughs> yep. Probably the only thing I'll ever be tied with Jerry Rice in. <laughs> Um, I think I'd rather be remembered for my social activism just because that will have a meaningful impact on people's lives. I mean, when you play sports, yeah, it's fun, you know, getting statistics is cool, being remembered for being a good player is cool, but having an impact on, on a child's life, you know, keeping, having a child look at what you've done and say to themselves, I can make it, I can go on, you know, that, that is a meaningful impact on the world. And that's, you know, if, if that's even one person that, that I've helped do that, then, I mean, to me, that's worth more than, than any amount of punting averages that I've had, so. All right. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I think Antoine Winfield was actually before before they let him go. Now I don't I don't know. I think Joe Webb's pretty good actually. He's uh out. Know. Uh, Colin Leffler and Blair Walsh because they're the people I see every day. <laughs> it's, uh, as specialists, we tend to hang out together for for pretty much the entire day, so you, you get to know each other pretty well. Uh. I look at them as two different games. COD is more a, a infantry simulation, whereas Battlefield is more a full spectrum war simulation in that, you know, they're, they, they, they just, they cover two different styles of, of fighting, so. Anyone else? Yeah. Well, it, it was more a personal thing, but also integrating the I'm going to go after this with everything I've got because that's, you know, that's how I approach things that are important to me is that if I'm, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it to the very best of my ability, you know, whether that be playing football or speaking out on something or playing video games. It's, you know, if it's, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing as hard as you can, you know, as, as, as best as you can. And so, you know, when I was asked, I was like, okay, you know, th yeah, this is something I can get behind and I will give you everything I have because I, I don't know how to do it differently. That's, uh, you know, that's, 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 that's probably what allowed me to become successful in the NFL is that, you know, I'm, I'm going to do my very best every time I'm out there. Oh. All right. Oh, there we go. you said that was the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it's the yeah the, the 
Right. Well, I mean, you, you have to be, you, you, can't, you can't have an arrogance. I mean, some guys do, but like, you, you have to be confident in yourself. But I also look at it like, the, I hate having to say that, but sometimes I have to say it because people are like, oh, your numbers are bad, or oh, you know, you're, you're a terrible punter. I'm like, no, like, <laughs> that's not the facts. I mean, and, and it bugs me every time I have to say it because if you have a cell phone, you can look it up on the internet. <laughs> it's like there's, there, the numbers are right there. They don't lie. And it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I would much prefer not to have to say anything and just let what I've done talk for me. But unfortunately, some people are just too lazy to go look. They would rather repeat what they hear from other people who were too lazy to go look. And then I'm like, well, no, that is wrong. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't like laziness or ignorance. <laughs> Ah, yes, the Ray Guy patch. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I, I knew I was going to get fined, but it was, uh, you know, I, I figured it would be worth it just because I had written a column probably about three days earlier chastising the Hall of Fame voting committee for not having Ray Guy in the Hall of Fame. I essentially said they were terrible at their job and they should stop. <laughs> and, uh, and then you know, I get to the game and there's a Hall of Fame patch on my jersey. I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> I just wrote out that these Hall of Fame people aren't doing their job. Well, all right, vote Ray Guy. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it was, it was just something when I saw it, I, I had no idea we were wearing the patches and when I saw it, I was like, well, I just, I don't agree with what they've done and so I'm going to say something about it, even though it cost me money and my wife was upset. <laughs> Um, I think I think it's another one of those things that has to start with society in general. You have to realize that, yes, you are playing football or, or baseball or whatever, but <clears throat> you are playing a children's game. Like, you, this is not something that is going to meaningfully impact the world. This is not something that is that important that you need to be ruining someone else's life for. And, and it, it's it's really just this idea that what do we value more? Do we value entertainment more or do we value education more? And so we, we have to be able to educate kids that when you play sports, yes, that's a great thing to do, but that does not define you as a person. That does not give you the right to ruin someone else's life. That does not give you the right to break the law. That does not put you on a pedestal above everyone else because you are still a human being. You need to act like other human beings, which means treating people with dignity and respect. And so it's, 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 again, boils down to that basic concept of treat other people the way you want to be treated. You know, in, instill that sense of empathy in people and make them understand that for every action you do, there is someone on the other side of that action. And if they're not cool with what you do, then reconsider what you're doing. Um, just tune it out. It's, uh, you know, I, I, when, I, when I go out on the field, I, you know, do my best. Some, most of the time I succeed, sometimes I don't. But it's, it's really just going out, focusing solely on what I'm doing at that moment. And, and I think that's one of the things that you'd find in pretty much every single professional athlete, is this ability to just focus in intensely on what they're doing right at that second. And, you know, that's, that's, that's what I do. I just go out, I'm like, okay, everything else, just put it aside. Right now, I am punting this football, and you know I'm, I'm going to try and do it to the best of my ability. Because if you're not able to put it aside, then you're going to let it affect you, and then you know you're not going to do as well. Mm-hmm. Um, mainly just raise them with the idea that whatever you want to do, you know, do it to the best of your ability and also realize that whatever you do will affect other people. And so, you know, if, if you do something, 
you know, understand that there, there are consequences to your actions. Understand that, you know, if you say something, someone might get hurt by that. And, and really just try and raise them, like my parents raised me, is treat other people the way you want to be treated. You know, have that, have that basic golden rule underlying the foundation of, of what they do. Because at that point, once you have that, then you can go on and do almost anything in your life. And if you treat people with empathy, then you'll, you'll be pretty successful. I mean, it's, unless you're a sociopathic CEO. I mean, that's a, <laughs> it seems to be almost a job requirement these days. But uh, no, you know, just, just trying to, trying to t teach your children that it's, it's okay to be who you are and it's okay for other people to be who they are. You know, it doesn't, you don't, you don't have to try to control other people's lives. Is that it? I think so. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.